Soy el doctor Oscar Valencia, coordinador de este espacio de educación médica continua. En nombre de la Escuela de Medicina y Ciencias de la Salud del Tecnológico de Monterrey, les doy la más cordial bienvenida a la sesión académica de pediatría. On behalf of the School of Medicine and Health Science of Tecnológico de Monterrey, I give you the most uh, warm welcome to our sesión académica de pediatría. And I'll give you the floor, Manuel, I'll give you the floor to our to our uh, dean of our school, so he will be able to present our speaker and also conduct the, the session. Okay, Manuel, give you the floor. Gracias, Oscar. Muy buenos días a todas y a todos. Good morning, everyone. And uh, uh, especially thank you very much, Phil, for your presence here in, your, in our session. This is the pediatric grand round, like uh, we said, and it's, uh, it's an honor, a pleasure having you here and having your talk that uh, I know that is a remarkable, uh, remarkable topic for us in, in, in the early childhood uh, initiative that we have in the Tech of Monterey. So thank you very much again for accepting our invitation and welcome to our community of pediatric community here at the Tech of Monterey. Phil Fisher, is the director of the Stanford Center of Early Childhood. Phil is an excellent, is the excellent in learning and with professor in the Graduate School of Education at Stanford University and director of the Stanford Center on Early Childhood. His research, his research focuses on developing and evaluating early childhood interventions in communities and on translating scientific knowledge regarding healthy development under condition of adversity for use in social policy and programs. He is currently the lead investigator in the ongoing Rapid EC project, a national survey on the well being of households with young children during the COVID 19 pandemic. Dr. Fisher is the recipient of the 2012 Society for Prevention Research Translational Science Award, and in 2019, Fellow of the American Psychological Society. Again, Phil, thank you very much for having you here, for, for accepting our invitations, and, and your, the floor is yours for your presentation. Thank you, Manuel, and thanks to all of you for attending. I understand in Monterey there was a, a big storm last night, so all of you who were able to, to uh, connect in spite of whatever may have happened vocally for you. Um, thank you for, for joining and um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Manuel mentioned, I'm going to be talking about some of the things that we've learned in the context of our work, um, our ongoing work, uh, beginning at the, at the start of the pandemic. Uh, I think these are lessons that um, were things that we were already thinking about that many of you, I'm sure, think Think about and know about as well, um, and I, I hope that the the conversation that we'll have afterwards will really um, allow us to explore how you can apply this work and this understanding um, to the to the work that all of you do as pediatricians or in the pediatric world. Uh, so uh, our center, as Manuel mentioned, is the center on early childhood. Um, why is it important to focus on early childhood? I think probably. Most of you know how much uh, evidence has been accruing about the importance of early childhood in terms of um, how it shapes children's development across the lifespan, um, and really that it's a period where the greatest amount of not only development is occurring, but also where the individual is most impacted by the world around them, by the experiences that they have. Um, and in particular by the relationships th that they have with parents and other adults in their lives um, as really impacting the way that, um, that, that their lives will, will unfold across time at a behavioral level, at a social level, uh, as well as at a, at a brain and biological level. Um, the other thing that's so critical about the early years is just how interconnected everything is. So. Um, the kinds of events that occur early in life don't just affect, say, one area of development. Um, they can affect, for example, children's brain development and their social development and therefore have an impact on their ability to learn in schools. And so all of these interconnected 
um, functions that are that are uh, impacted so much by the early environment make this an extremely important period to understand. We also know uh, from research in the U.S. and elsewhere um, that the gaps that exist between uh, the uh, the the most well-off children in in uh, specific countries and those who do not have as much opportunity in terms of the the uh, economic circumstances that they are born into um, have been widening in many countries uh, in recent years. Uh, and um, so what we see is that um, across really the globe um, that there the gaps between uh, children really widen as they um, spend more and more time in school, such that in the US, for example, this is work of Sean Reardon, by the time um, children are in fifth grade, they can be as much as three years behind um, other children uh, in their learning. Um, and it appears that these trends are only increasing in many places. Um, the other thing that uh, I really want to focus on in this talk, that is so much something that has become clear to us during the pandemic, is that I think we've tended to think about the kinds of early life experiences as either being sort of positive environments, ones that support children's development, or ones that are less supportive, parents that are uh, that are not particularly attentive to their children, or are living in places where they're not able to provide adequate stimulation for their children. Any number of things um, can can kind of impact that. But one of the additional variables that has become really clear, and that there's a lot of growing research on, is the impact of being in a just a simply unpredictable environment. And whether that's unpredictable in terms of what's happening immediately around you uh, in relationships with adults in your life as a young, as an infant or a young child, or whether it's more um, sort of larger circumstances like the pandemic introduced, but also like we're seeing in terms of climate, in terms of some of the geopolitical instability in the world, um, all of these things uh, clearly are having an impact and pose risks to young children. And so as these kinds of events, global events, and just things in the lives of young children increase, even children who are in nurturing environments um, have potential to be exposed to unpredictability. And this in and of itself seems to be additive in terms of the impacts that it's having. So um, with my colleague, Sahang Lu, uh, I uh, developed a model on sort of how we can understand the effects of unpredictability based on what we know kind of from the, the prior research. This is kind of pandemic related unpredictability. And you can see in this outer ring um, are things like the, the changes in public health guidance, lack of clear information coming out, policy changes. Uh, and even the various waves of the virus introduced um, ongoing kinds of uh, unpredictability, if you can think back that far um, and still remember the early days of the pandemic and how much change was going on. In that context, we saw a lot of things happening uh, more locally. So going from the sort of the larger societal context of how we grapple with the pandemic, we saw um, at a community level, many uh, children in the US were unable to go to preschool, um, or, or other kinds of care environments. There were a lot of changes happening locally in terms of what was allowed and what wasn't allowed. All of those things introduced at the community level more uncertainty in the lives of kids. And then that clearly, uh, and some of our data support this, also these kinds of changes had a lot of impacts on uh, families' income, on the extent to which they were able to uh, get food that they needed, on getting medical care and so forth. Um, those kinds of events um, we know have a lot of potential to disrupt the the development of children along many different kind of um, lines that you see over on the right. Um, but I think one of the things that's really important is that we we understand that, um, as many have described it, that the the reason that these kinds of events have the, these negative outcomes for so many children 
is because they, they lead to adaptations and changes in neurobiological processes at many different levels. So we see changes at the level of the brain. In particular, certain brain regions seem to accelerate in their development, whereas others are, are more delayed. The circuitry that kind of links various areas of the brain together are impacted. We also see changes more at the level of biological stress response systems and other systems like immune and metal metabolic function. And this is where some of these additional effects have really uh, the potential to compromise physical health, increase the likelihood of, of cardiovascular disease, of metabolic dis disorders, of inflammatory disorders um, that can then be part of the pathway that impacts kids' development. Um, in the US, um, we've done research uh, of our own, this predates the pandemic, on the impact of unpredictability um, in children's uh, brain and, and social, emotional, and, and, uh, and academic development. So this is a study that we did a number of years ago, co a collaboration with my colleague Nathan Fox um, for children that were engaged in the, in the child protection system in the US. One of the major um, aspects of that system is that once children get engaged, especially if they are removed from the care of their, their birth families, they typically have, have many changes in who they're living with. The system doesn't do a good job of keeping children in one um, substitute family. And so they often move around a lot before a final kind of um, home is found for them or they go back to their birth family. And so they're, they're experiencing this kind of chronic ongoing instability. Um, the study that we did looked at brain activity. We use an, uh, a method called event-related potentials where we um, expose children uh, to certain stimuli in a laboratory on a computer. They get shown these, um, these kind of stimuli on a screen, and then we record brain activity on the surface of the scalp using one of these nets that we put on, on the children's scalp to, um, to record electrical activity via these electrodes. Um, and what you can see when you do this is when you, when you flash things on a screen and have people perform a task, is that there are changes in the amount of brain activity in various regions of the of the scalp that correspond to various underlying brain regions. Um, and what you're seeing here is a particular um, measure that looks at when people make a mistake, um, there is an increase in brain activity in this front central part of the brain um, in response to making a mistake. And here you see that increase in activity um, relative to when um, a correct response is made. So we do this with kids. Again, you can do the same kind of thing with children that you do with adults. Um, and what we do is, is called a flanker task. The flanker task presents a series of, of colored dots that come on the screen right above this white dot. And we tell, tell the participant, these are three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old children, that um, they are supposed to put push a button on a box that they have that only has two colors, red and green, that corresponds to the to the circle that's above the white dot. And you can see here, this is a pretty easy task because everything's the same color. So you just push the green button, here you push the red button. But these trials where kids are shown a, a color that's different from the ones on the outside, these flanker um, colors on the sides is more difficult kids tend to take longer and they make more mistakes. And so it's possible to measure brain activity in response to making mistakes. And then in addition, um, Dr. Fox, uh, University of Maryland, introduced into the task feedback because with young kids, they don't always know that they're making mistakes. So after the child pushes the, the correct or incorrect button, they either get a smiley face or a frowny face. So we're really what we're looking at here is the amount of brain activity in response to feedback that you're getting from the world around you that you have done something that's not correct. And again, what you expect to see when there's an incorrect response um, is that there's uh, that there's not like that there back here, sorry, slides are different than I than I thought. Um, what you expect to see is an increase in electrical activity, again, in response to a mistake being made. What we did, what we found when we looked at children in um, in care, was that whether they made a mistake or not, it didn't make a difference. There was really no diminished uh, or increased brain activity 
in response to making a mistake. And th that corresponds to, to these children being much less responsive in the classroom and in their home environments to getting feedback. Um, we see similar kinds of sort of changes in the pandemic population of kids who have had um, a lot of exposure to unpredictability, uh, it's struggling with a lot of issues in the aftermath of the pandemic. Um, and so you saw in the, in the last two years that an increase in the number of um, scientific publications that have collected data that show a number of challenges in the well-being of children and in how they're doing in school um, following the, the tremendous unpredictability of the pandemic. Um, I do want to make clear that um, in spite of a lot of concerns that have been raised, that not all children exposed to unpredictability um, <laughs> of various sorts are likely to show um, long-term impacts uh, because the pandemic was not the same kind of really extreme um, experience for children, for many children, relative to what I was describing previously with um, with kids who are in child protection. So we expect some variation um, along a fairly normal distribution about the sort of long-term impacts of the pandemic itself. Um, but regardless, we um, we feel like it's important to document the experiences and to really be able to measure their impacts as we move forward in time. And so um, I'm going to just, for the remainder of my presentation, talk about two ways that we have been developing at our center to really um, think about how to identify the impacts of the kind of world that's evolving um, that has um, many of these unpredictable qualities to it um, in and develop solutions that can make a difference um, at both at a national level in terms of some of our, of our policies that we may put in place um, in various countries, but also in terms of what we can do more locally. Um, and so one thing clearly is to, is to really listen well to what adults in the lives of young children are telling us about the experiences that they're having and that young kids are having um, in order to design and measure the impact of solutions that we might put in place, whether they're policies or various kinds of programs that might help to, to support young kids and families. And then the other is looking for ways to really uh, bolster or support, hold up the, the experiences that children are having, and uh, most importantly, to support the, the adults in their lives, their families, but others also in the communities who take care of children and design solutions um, based on kind of those supports. So the first way that we've done this in terms of listening is through uh, what um, Manuel mentioned at the beginning, which is a a survey that we started at the very beginning of the pandemic. It, it's now been going on for four years. Um, it turned four years old in April. So it's it's an early childhood um, survey in and of itself. Um, the, uh, the other thing I'm gonna be talking about uh, after I've talked about the survey is a, a program that we've developed called FIND, which uses video um, to help support uh, a more predictable, consistent and nurturing environment for children. So first, RAPID. Um, what is it? It's a survey that um, it was designed to be um, very frequent um, in the the how often uh, it goes out. So it, it currently goes out on a monthly basis. It takes about 15 minutes to complete um, and um, it can be done by smartphone or tablet or computer um, available in many languages. We when we started it, what we knew was that we needed a um, an approach that would allow us to gather information about a, a variety of really key areas of of uh, the what's going on in the lives of young children. So the emotional well being of children, the well being of the, of the parents, those who are taking care of children, um, the economic circumstances, the extent to which um, parents can obtain the basic things that they need, like food and um, a place to live uh, and things like that. The, their ability to have someone take care of the child if they need that so that they can work. And then the healthcare that they have access to. Um, and so we've asked about these on a recurring basis now for four years. We ask both um, questions that can be answered numerically and also questions that are more open-ended where people can 
um, can write in responses. Um, and these produce a, a large num large amount of data every time the survey goes out. So um, survey gets about a thousand participants each time um, from in the case of the US survey from all over the United States, from all of 50 states. Um, and we're able to then um, analyze that data and produce content um, very quickly within a few weeks of when, when we get the survey data back. Um, this really allows us, um, because of the way the survey is designed, to be able to be putting information out that really helps uh, adults in the lives of young children know that someone's listening, but also makes the information available to a lot of different sources that can make use of it. To those involved in policy, policy and advocating for um, young children and their families, um, for people interested in designing strategies and programs to help support, for researchers, um, and then for parents themselves, just so, so that they can know that they're listened to. Um, we um, have consistently been putting out um, a variety of different sources of information, including fact sheets on the RAPID website, um, but we also do publish our findings often in scientific journals. Let me just quickly go through um, what some of the main findings are. So one, one thing that we learned that I think was not fully understood was the very high percentage of households in the US with young children that can't afford to pay for basic needs. At least one in four families from the very start of the survey, um, and at times as many as, um, as two in five um, have been struggling to pay for things like food or for housing. We, the, one of the things that's quite interesting about our survey is that there was actually one period where the rates went down to lower than before the pandemic. And that was when the national government of the US had a policy in place pretty briefly for families to receive extra government uh, money for, the, for each child in their home. It was called the child tax credit. Um, and they received the money on a monthly basis. And so you almost have a basic income experiment here where you can see the rates of hardship going down um, dramatically during that period of time when the, the national policy was in place. Um, the reason that um, beyond that it's just not a good thing for so many families to be struggling to make ends meet um, is that we've, we've seen this as problematic is because of what we refer to as the chain reaction of hardship. Um, and what you see here is sort of an a, a illustration of that, which is that um, in our survey data, when families report that they don't have enough money to pay for these basic kinds of needs, that when we follow them over time, we see increases in um, adults being distressed, having difficulties with depression, loneliness, anxiety, stress in general. Um, and then when we continue to follow those families out in time, those adults who are distressed are more likely to subsequently report that children are having a hard time. So that that very pathway that I was talking about at the beginning, where we see kind of the disruption of typical development of biological and behavioral systems is really in, in the context of our data um, being driven by the kinds of experiences that may make it harder for adults to provide the nurturing and kind of buffering care that they typically might be able to provide to reduce children's exposure to stress. Um, and we see this in our data in a variety of ways, but this just shows that both for adult distress, um, which is the yellow bars and um, children's having difficulties as well with their behavior, that you can see a very linear relationship where the, not just the sort of having some of this, but it's sort of additive. The more areas that people say they can't pay for basic needs, the more distress we're seeing on the parts of adults and children. And then um, again, with my colleague Sahang Liu and some others, we looked at the extent to which um, the these experiences of unpredictability um, were having an impact on children's development and indeed, um, the unpredictability that we saw just in the, the ability to make ends meet or to pay for basic needs added additional distress to both child and caregiver reports uh, of difficulties 
over and above just how much just how much uh, hardship they were having. So unpredictability kind of contributes additional um, challenging experience to the lives of, of families with young kids. And others, um, including this paper by Laura Glenn and colleagues, showed similar kinds of opposite effects, which was that a predictable environment seemed to help children um, deal with the, the unpredictability that was going on in the world. Um, we also, as I mentioned, are able to analyze the rapid data um, in terms of the open-ended responses that, um, that we see from caregivers about things like um, questions that we ask about things like, what are your biggest concerns? What's going well right now? Um, when we do that, when we analyze the, these longer text-based responses, we can extract themes. And what you can see here is just that for a period of time in the pandemic, um, that a lot of the uh, issues that people were expressing concerns about had to do with difficulties with school or learning, um, with their jobs, with money. So a lot of financial kinds of issues and a lot of school-related issues kind of were coming out of what we were learning from this survey. Um, we can also use the text-based responses and analyze them to examine how frequently specific topics come up. This is a topic in the early days of the pandemic that had to do with how much parents were saying they were concerned about their kids' school. And what you can see here is that um, as we got into the first summer of the pandemic, people being worried about whether their kids would be able to be in school or be learning reached kind of a peak and then it decreased across time. So being able to track not just what are people saying, but how frequently are these kinds of topics coming up um, across time is, is very helpful, again, for thinking about responding to the needs that families are expressing. And then we can also analyze our open-ended data in some really interesting ways where we segment it by things like income level. And if you look at income-based differences in the kinds of topics that people are talking about of the biggest concerns, on the top here, what you see are families that are at very low income levels. And you can see that they were mostly reporting that the challenges had to do with things having to do with income. Um, being able to afford basic necessities, not being able to work, having increased debt, paying expenses. When we looked at the middle and upper income families, really a lot of what their concerns, the biggest concerns about had to do with isolation and loneliness and inability to have someone watch their children. And so you can also really clearly see that there are differences in the concerns that people have based on things like income level. You can also do this based on where people are living location-wise in cities or in non-city areas, um, based on the age of the child, based on other kinds of demographic factors. And so it's a good way to understand how differences might exist across the population. As I mentioned, um, this tool has been very useful for um, informing how we might design programs to support families. It's also having an increasingly big impact uh, on efforts to, um, to design policies and sort of advocate for the needs of children. And in some instances, um, it appears to be having uh, an ability to, to document the impact of, um, of particular policies and programs that get put in place. And as I mentioned, it's also really helping us understand the needs of, uh, of children and families for program design. Um, I wanna note that one of the things that's most interesting that's happened with RAPID over the last four years is that we've got an, an increasing amount of interest and therefore have um, expanded our work with RAPID um, from uh, smaller kind of geographic units. So in the US, a number of states, including the state of California, um, now have a rapid survey of their own running in addition to the national survey. And then many communities, smaller municipalities, bigger cities, um, some geographic areas that are more regional are also doing their own surveys. And we, we so we see this as really a tool that can inform research, but more importantly, that's clearly providing data that's of value and more local levels. Um, and we think that that's quite interesting. Um, we've had some interest in expanding to other countries. We're very interested in that um, and have had some, some discussions about potential for that in Mexico and Latin America. 
So that's the rapid survey. Uh, I'm going to shift now and um, and talk about one of the solutions that has been part of our our kind of design work um, dating predating the pandemic, but really um, has be kind of come into its own and is and clearly is is responding to some of the challenges that we see and hear about from families. Um, and that's the FIND program. FIND is a video coaching program. Um, there are a number of different video coaching programs that have been developed and that have strong evidence bases. Um, so there are some, some differences between FIND and some of the other um, video coaching approaches that are out there. Um, there are also some similarities across all of these programs where essentially <clears throat> by filming adults interacting with children, and then viewing the videos, you have a much more um, very powerful um, example of what's happening between the adult and, and the child that, uh, that the adult can really pay attention to because it's them. It's not, it's not just somebody talking about what to do or showing somebody else. Um, find in, in, the, in the context of our intervention uh, is designed to be very much focused on showing the strengths of what, what adults are doing in their interactions with children so that they can do more of it. Um, in particular, we focus on this concept that was developed at the Center on the Developing Child at Harvard um, and the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child that I was a member of, of serve and return interactions. These are interactions where the child is exploring the world um, and maybe vocalizing or pointing um, or just looking at something and an adult notices what the child is doing and responds in a meaningful way. Um, one of the things that's nice about this approach is that it allows for, um, for cross kind of context um, support. So we, we originally developed this for parents, um, but we now increasingly use it in, in school settings and preschool settings um, and in the context of other adults who take care of young children. It, it fits in all of those different places. Um, the video coaching involves focusing on specific elements of this serve and return process um, and showing them in coaching sessions kind of in a sequential way. Um, so you can see the various five elements that we focus on that are pretty straightforward here. Um, back and forth is just where the serve happens, the adult returns the serve, and then the interaction continues back and forth after that initial part. And endings and beginnings are in particular, a situation where the child may be interacting with the adult and then their attention shifts to something else and the adult follows the child into the next focus of activity. Um, the way in which we do this is we film in the natural environment. We then extract content. We, so the moments where good things are happening um, that fall into those different elements that I just mentioned. And then we create an edited film and a coach will then show that film to the adult and kind of talk them through these brief moments. The clips that we edit and select for the coaching are often very brief, anywhere between five seconds and 30 seconds. Um, and so part of the process that's really critical is that after we've extracted a clip and we know we're going to use it, we then break it down into much smaller pieces so that we can show the interaction uh, from start to finish in much more of a broken down kind of way, then we show it in its, in its entirety again. And so people can really see the whole process of that serve and return unfolding with them doing it. Um, most recently um, at Stanford, there is a tremendous amount of capability to use artificial intelligence and machine learning. And so this process in the middle of editing and extracting content and breaking it down into small pieces is something that's historically taken us a very long time to do. Um, but now um, working with computer scientists who are experts in machine learning, we're actually able to upload the recordings um, into a, a, a machine learning model, um, extract the content that we know that we're looking for and then uh, create this edited film. And really what it does is, is to take something that um, historically involved not only collecting film, but then editing it and really reduce the amount of effort that's required to be usable by a practitioner or coach. Um, and here you can see an example of the kind of um, interface that we're now developing 
to be able to create these films automatically. We can envision a time, um, especially in terms of thinking about this audience in, in pediatrics, where if a parent comes in with a young child for just a regular visit, a preventive healthcare visit or a checkup, that while they're waiting to see the doctor, that just being observed and letting them know that they're going to be filmed um, while they're waiting for the doctor interacting with the child, that by the time the doctor comes in, that they could have on their tablet examples of the parent interacting moments before that they would then go over with the parent to show them positive interaction. So we think this has a lot of potential. Um, I want to note that our evaluations of um, this very simple approach that doesn't really require many hours of interacting with, um, with parents and children to really teach them this coaching um, is, has been found to be very effective at things like uh, the amount of words that, um, that adults are uttering in the context of this kind of interaction process, um, the amount of back and forth language between adults and children in the context of, uh, of regular language. Um, we see improvements in the extent to which adults, um, parents feel more effective in interacting with children um, and are more uh, able to do good teaching with them. Um, we find impacts on children's language development. Um, and um, interestingly, we also have observed a, a quite a, a noteworthy effect on parents' brain functioning. So the, the video coaching really encourages parents to wait and watch and, and, and see what the child will do next. And um, when, we, when we examine how that impacts adults' ability to wait or to not do something kind of impulsively, this concept of inhibitory control, on a computer task, we find that parents get better at waiting um, than, uh, than those in the control group in this small RCT um, after, from before to after the intervention. And we see that that actually corresponds to impacts in parental brain activity in this one area related to self-control um, for those who receive this kind of coaching. So nice example of how even though we talk oftentimes about uh, child brain plasticity, that these kinds of approaches can also be very effective at supporting um, uh, adults' brain activity um, and kind of creating in enhanced behavior that's associated with parenting that has underlying um, features in the activity that we see in the brain of adults receiving the coaching. Um, we in developing find really, as I mentioned, thought that it was a platform that could be used in multiple settings because it really focuses on serve and return, which is something that happens in all contexts with, with adults interacting with young children. And so far, as you can see here, it's been used in a variety of different contexts um, that, uh, that we have in the US. We've also done it in a number of other locations outside of the US um, and continue to experience positive results. Um, so I'm just going to tie things up um, and, and sort of talk about some general conclusions um, that, we've, that we've observed in the context of the work that we've done to date. First of all, um, I think that it's safe to say that the, the world that young children are coming into these days is much less predictable and um, much less sort of reliable in terms of things that can occur that are outside of the child and even the family's control um, than it was 20 years ago. Um, I will say that um, in response to that, that we have seen many parents and other adults really rise to the challenge and do a lot to support and protect children in the context of these uncertainties. But because the scientific evidence is showing that unpredictability has a negative effect on children's development over and above um, what we might see just from bad things happening to children, that not knowing what's happening next is in and of itself a so-called toxic stressor, um, that we really need to be attuned to the extent to which unpredictability may be making a, a difference, a negative kind of difference in the lives of young children. 
And so I think it, it that makes it critical to really understand what kinds of circumstances are increasing or decreasing um, the, the amount of predictability in young children's environments. And to think about then how, once we've heard that kind of information, we can design programs and strategies and policies to help address this. Um, we see there being a huge amount of potential right now, not just in terms of approaches that have been available for a long time, like the kinds of surveys I was talking about, but also what some of the tools that are coming from the world of artificial intelligence and machine learning um, might be useful for and be applied to helping to scale solutions that can really make a difference in the lives of young children. I want to be really clear that these kind of advances that we're seeing in artificial intelligence and machine learning will not any time that we would anticipate um, or want really, um, will, we, they will not replace human expertise. Um, what, what they can do is function as a very valuable assistant to take away and, and not require some of the tasks that are quite low level, but that are still very time consuming um, and, and therefore just increase the, the efficiency of the efforts that we're kind of undergoing to support uh, adults in the lives of young children. So um, I think there's reason to be concerned. There's also great reason to be hopeful in terms of the advances that we're seeing. Um, and I think we're seeing a lot of the impacts happening at a more local and community level. And that also suggests sort of increasing empowerment um, of those who are most involved in the lives of young children. Um, so reason to be hopeful and reason to also continue to use all of these tools um, to impact change. Uh, I'm going to stop there and I'll stop sharing and then we'll have some time for questions and for discussion. Thank you very much, Phil. Remarkable presentation. Uh, very useful information about your your tools. Thank you for sharing with us the, the rapid and the, and the fine programs. I think is something very innovative, but uh, with a, with a very clear social impact and focusing in the in the well being of of the early childhood of childhood and the and the people. So we have a, many questions, uh, but uh, because of the time, we'll we'll be able to to ask you a few of them. Sure. Uh, one one of one of the that is uh, constantly constantly asked to us is as pediatricians what we should we do in a daily basis to support children so they will have their their best development and i know that you show the program but maybe you have some other comments that support the the creation of these programs and the results that you already share with us yeah the the in the rapid data when we looked at what helps, uh, what, what kinds of things are making a difference to have a, a counteracting effect on the unpredictability? Two things came out of our data consistently. The first one was for parents to be able to maintain daily routines or schedules as much as possible. So you know, the pandemic was certainly a time when it was hard to to adjust our schedules because there were so many things changing all the time. But parents that were able to still have have children wake up at the same time and encourage parents to, um, you know, we, or when when parents were able to to have bedtime at, and have regular meal times, those things seemed to be making a difference in reducing the distress levels of young children. And then I think another thing, that we've heard from pediatricians is a really helpful piece of information was that just parents reporting quality time spent with their children. So just time that they enjoyed and that the child enjoyed where they seemed to be focused on, a, on an activity that both liked without having to define it as you have to read to your child or you have to play with your child, but just doing, doing good quality time with your children in and of itself made a difference. And I, I think for pediatricians, offering advice to parents, just remembering that uh, taking time to spend with your children and enjoy it is in and of itself something that can make a difference 
and protecting your child from the circumstances in the world. So routines and quality time um, are sort of the things that are most well supported in the data. And they're easy things to encourage parents to do. You don't have to coach them and do those more intensive things. It's just good, good practical advice. Yeah, you're, you're totally right. We we always recommend quality time, but but most of the times we do not tell them how or or, or when or which which are the uh, the specific activities that they must do. And and yeah. you're putting the, the the precise emphasis in the in the way that we be a, a good uh, a good counselor in in health for them even in, in, in not only in the in terms of the emergency and the pandemic right now i think the pandemic yes. gave us the opportunity gave us the opportunity to to change our, our lifestyles yes. and to focus in, in, in the in the in the children and to focus in this quality time that you're saying the routines and many other activities that in the daily we do and, and we do not think much about what we are doing and how we're doing so yes. thank you thank you very much phil it's a it's a great answer and it's a, a good for for the pediatricians that we have here and and we also have residents and and students that are learning from us and learning from from many sites that they're they're reading and, and seeing are, are so that is very useful for them too and um, there's another uh, question about how can we use rapid in our, in in our offices uh, does it have any cost or do we have to register or do something in a specific to use it? Rapid works well as a um, as a population based measure. Um, <laughs> so, in terms of gathering the survey information, um, it's it's useful um, to understand kind of what a larger group of of individuals, whether it's people in in the overall pediatric practice, whether it's people in a particular town or a particular community, it's useful in that way. We haven't really thought about using it as a, as a kind of a screening tool or a way of gathering information um, from families that could be used at the more individual level. I don't see there, there's no reason why it, it couldn't be used in that way. Um, and we would be very happy to share the basic measure um, that we use and you know if people are interested in trying it out i think that would be fine um it you know it, it could potentially reveal useful information just about kind of these very basic areas of how parents are doing um that relate to to the well-being of their child so it's an interesting possibility um i'm happy to um I, I think I, I listed in the slide presentation yep. Um, yep. people that you could contact. Um, also, I'll share with Manuel after the um, after the, the the grand rounds today a link <clears throat> to the slides so that you can get in touch if you're interested in that. Thank you, Phil, for that. And we uh, we know that it'll be very useful for for practice. We have a, a, a big practice here at the Tech of Monterey, but we also have a lot of pediatricians from. Monterey, from Mexico, yeah. and from uh, different countries. So it's going to be very helpful to have yeah. the information and the way we access to that. And uh, we have another comment, very interesting here. <laughs> As pediatricians, we also need to have quality time during our during consultation, during our, our consultations, to give advice. Yeah, this <laughs> this totally right, right? Agreed. Yeah. So I think uh, we must. Uh, Give, uh, we must to understand the the, the well being concept and and to reflect it in our in our practice not only like uh, professionals like uh, like humans and to to impact uh, in the in the best way to to our patients. So I think it's a uh, it's a nice uh, comment and, and and very good for for us. So uh, another. Um, comment that you would want to give us uh, as recommendation for all the people that we have, uh, not only for pediatricians, for many other people in the audience that is in contact with uh, children, early childhood, and also children elder than, than daily childhood. Do, do you want to give us another, a few final comments? I think that um, the, 
the original idea with a lot of the tools that we've developed has been to think about things that are that are practical and usable. I think we when we see the challenges that um, in in working with families with young children in whatever role, pediatrics or others, um, I think we see the problems and challenges as complicated, and we've created complicated solutions as a result. And that's why, I, to me, the idea of things like quality time, the quality time in consultation, quality time in your family is really critical because I think it reduces the, the complexity to just what are the most basic things that are needed. And in that context, for example, with FIND, we found that showing people examples of them doing things that they already know how to do rather than kind of trying to teach them complicated new things increases the likelihood that they'll do those, the things that are, we know support development. And that then has, it fixes a lot of the other problems like parental distress um, and other kinds of issues. It doesn't, doesn't solve everything, but a lot of these complicated problems can be addressed with more simple solutions. And when those can be found, um, I think those are the kinds of things that we um, orient to and that we're, we're, we want people to be able to think about those kinds of solutions in that way. So thank you again, Phil, uh, for being our honor guest speaker and closing this month uh, at the Grand, at the Pediatric Grand Rounds. Uh, this month was dedicated to early childhood. We had four really good presentations, but uh, the honor to have you close in the month and and to, to, to have your remarkable presentation and also these useful tools that we we are sure that we are going to start using and start uh, having another perspective in, in, in our practice and and then also to focus in, in the, the, the relevance of early childhood that is uh, really needed in, in, our, in our country. So thank you again, Phil. It was, as always, a pleasure to, to talk to you, to listen to you, and to have the opportunity to interact with you. So I, I know we have many other opportunities Yes, to share to share information and the yes. relationship between our centers. Yes, that is, is growing very good. So Excellent. thank you again. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Take care, everybody. Uh, Oscar, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Philip. And y los espera. Muchas gracias, Manuel, por la conducción de este y, y coordinación de este módulo. Eh, los esperamos. Eh, muchas gracias a nuestra audiencia. Y los esperamos la próxima semana en donde vamos a iniciar con nuestro módulo de neurología pediátrica y tendremos la primera sesión de neuroinfecciones en niños. Que tengan un excelente día.